So, do you remember these? Ions, cations, anions, all these things. Well, they uh, go into this. Remember this? I showed this before, that there's these supposed three states, solid, liquid, gas, and I told you about other states that aren't on this for some reason. The crystalline state, which is off that way, and class, which is sort of like this. It's sort of like a liquid which is solid. It's a super cooled liquid. And so you can see, if you look at this, it's like a waterfall frozen in time, which is exactly what it is. But it's not water, it is glass, mostly made of quartz. So if you can imagine, it's like a waterfall and it's frozen. That's what glass is. So these were quite cool. Uh, these are these pictures. They tried to image uh, silica glass and crystals. And you can see that it's uh, it's sort of stringing together, but not as much as crystal and not as much as a normal solid would be. And this is what the images they created actually look like. And I'm mostly including it because it looks really cool. So glass. Now, the point of the double arrow is to make you aware that the entire uh, slide, all the information on here, is important. And so you should take a note of it. So ancient glass probably comprised about 75% quartz. Uh, this is called a former in glass, glass uh, vocabulary, a former, which because it forms the glass. 75% of it is quartz, so that's a lot. And you have... Soda, about 15%. Sodium oxide. This is the flux. So the flux acts on the quartz to make it melt at a lower temperature. Uh, just as when winter comes, and winter is coming, um, there is ice on your sidewalk, and you put salt on it. And the salt makes the water melt at a lower temperature than it otherwise would do. It's not that salt melts uh, water no matter what to the temperature. It will just enable it to melt at a lower temperature than it would have done otherwise. And that is a flux. And soda acts as a flux on quartz. There's also a stabilizer. About 10% of this could be uh, calcium oxide lime. And that's a stabilizer. So that's a typical glass. Other elements you might get include aluminium, which supposedly improves the chemical durability of the glaze and prevents recrystallization. Magnesium decreases the solubility of the glass. Potash is another flux, and so you might, may sometimes get pot potassium, potash glass, rather than soda glass. And this uh, hardens more rapidly and at a higher temperature. Lead oxide is also a flux, um, so you can have lead glass. This creates a glass of a lower suffering temperature and quite a high density. It's very heavy. So how you make glass, I and mean, you could just take everything and melt it together, but this doesn't seem to be that common in the ancient world, and they mostly use what is known as fritting. Fritting. <clears throat> Again, the double arrows. So, with fritting, you take the raw materials, the potash, the quartz, the uh, lime, and you grind them finely together, and then heat them. And this actually is a glass furnace found at a site in Israel called Bet Eliezer. Eliezer. And it was just this big sheet of glass, and people wondered what it was until they worked out what it was, which is they were fritting glass. So it is important at this stage that they do not become liquid. Sintering or fritting between 750 and 850 degrees centigrade, stirring all the time for several hours. So you don't want it to become liquid because that will create all sorts of problems. You just want it to slowly sinter together in the quartz, 
and the potash and the lime all become one. You keep stirring them together. This allows outgassing. Uh, if you don't allow the gas to leave, um, they're left inside the glass. They're called seeds and uh, it's very difficult to get rid of them. There's also unreacted material. These are called stones and these also remain in the glass. The frit is then ground to a powder. This is actually how we make Egyptian blue, which we shall get onto when we talk a bit about colorant later on. And so this is a powdered glass, essentially. Uh, by fritting these raw materials together, then grinding it to a powder, what you have is powdered glass. So if you heat it up, you have glass. Very useful. And so early glass seems to be mostly in this part of the world. Until Judea on the Amuk plain of Syria, which is where the big red dot is. Here's a close up, it's here. Um, here's Antakya. Uh, here we have the earliest glass objects in the, from the third millennium BC. And they're beads. Um, you, they make them by rolling the soft glass around a straight rod of 3.6 millimeters diameter. Pretty exciting. Um, by the mid third millennium, beads were more common, found at a number of sites in the west of uh, the Middle East, in Western Syria and in uh, Mesopotamia. People working on the terminology of this period seem to feel, feel that the words do not originate in Mesopotamia. They're not Sumerian or Akkadian, they're West Semitic. Basically, they're Syrian. And so all the words that describe glass um, are used for glass are actually Western Semitic words, which would also support that it was developed in the Western Semitic land, basically Western Syria. In Egypt, we have evidence of glass beads from the later third millennium BC. Glass vessels. There it is evidence at Talalak. Talachana, right? Alalak, which is here, very near Tayanak, which is quite well known in the University of Toronto. Uh, circles. You can see how this entire region seems to be very, very big on making glass. So this is a part of an industry making beads that look a bit like this, but these are much later. Uh, they also made the first glazed earthenware in this period. And the glass vessels they make made were core formed. Core formed vessels. And in this you have a rod and of course they've been using metal rods to make beads for many years and in this case they put um, a lump of clay at the end shaped like the interior of the vessel and then you have the glass so so glass is quite easy to melt you can do it with a candle in fact working glass in small amounts is often called candle work and so with with a source of heat, you can melt enough glass so that it's molten and will stick to the outside of this core. And you twirl it around until you build up the vessel. And you can decorate it, you can add handles, again using lamp work, it will stick to itself and bring it over here. And there you have your vessel. And of course, you probably like got some to dig out the, the clay core from the inside. Glass casting is something that come along. Uh, and in this, you have a mold and you pour glass into it. And so that will make a nice uh, vessel on the outside, but it's solid. But of course, then you're just using the same techniques as you would if you were making a stone vessel. And so it's been drilled through from the outside to create a vessel that's hollow by drilling it, just as you would if you're making a stone vessel. This is the Sargon vase, which was supposedly made in just this way. Glass blowing. So this seems to date from about the mid first century BC. There was a site at Tel Anafa in Israel in which they had a lot of molded glass vessels. 
dated to about 175 to 125 BC, but not a single piece of blown glass. So presumably, since this is a, you know, a lot of glass here, probably a glass production center, um, they weren't making blown glass. However, in Jerusalem, sealed under a floor of about 40 BC, was a glass shop workshop filled with blown glass. So sometime between 40 BC and 125, 175 BC, they started blowing glass. So in the early Roman imperial period, Phoenicia was known as a major glass producer. So the technique is thought to have been developed there. And here we have a glass Phoenician just to support that hypothesis. One of the lines of evidence for blowing glass is uh, a pontal scar. A pontal is a rod uh, which you use to work the vessel. Um, you can see I have a lump of glass at the end here. You, you would have created a gather of glass, as it's called, a gather of glass um, with that. And with that, you would have formed a vessel. Uh, a blowpipe, for which you will blow the glass, or blown glass, will work in exactly the same way and will also leave what is known as a pontil mark. This is a recent glassmaker's kiln. And so basically you have a source of heat here, rather like a pottery kiln. And here you have molten glass, so it keeps the glass molten all of the time while it's being worked. And so the, the glass worker is here, he'll put in a pontil or a blowpipe to get a gather of glass, take it out and work it. Like this chap. So you can see he's he's a blower, a, so his face doesn't get hot, and he's got a gather of glass. Melted glass is called here, but it's called a gather, by poking it into the kiln and bringing out some glass. Here we have some in Syria, and here you can see they have all the important attributes that they need. Nice pot of tea here, keeping warm on the kiln, very, very important. So this is a gather. So he's got a gather of glass, which he's got from out from inside the kiln. And um, he's using his blowpipe to blow into it. So he's blowing into it. Up here is the annealing chamber. So in here is the molten glass being kept warm. See this chap is working this piece, this guy is blowing this piece. But after you've worked it, a lot of it is done when it's starting to get cooler. And so it's under stress. It's, it's not happy glass when it's been just been worked. And so what you will do is put it in the annealing chamber. And so up here it's quite hot. Not so hot it will melt the glass, but hot enough so they'll start getting kind of relaxed, rather like a nice dry sauna, shall we say. And in here, the, the glass will, will relax and any tensions within its structure will dissipate. Here's some nice glass. This is Roman glass, probably made at Sidon. Um, and it uh, looks like it's been blown into a mold. Isn't that clever, isn't it? And of course, this will be added later. These are quite interesting blown glass. They're made probably in Syria, but they were found in China. And it's interesting to note when we get to things like porcelain, which of course were, was a Chinese invention, came to the Middle East, and they thought that this was like a miracle that you would have such hard uh, ceramic body. But conversely, in China, they thought blown glass was a miracle. And so there, are, there was vast amounts of blown glass transported to East Asia, and particularly to China. And all along the Indian Ocean route, there are glass uh, trading sites covered with glass that never got all the way. So glass was a very important uh, material made in the Middle East. Glazes. Let's do a bit about glazes. So glazes, of course, are glass on pottery, anthropogenic glass, again, probably made of silica. So the melting temperature of silica is between 610 and 1730 degrees centigrade. 
don't forget the double arrows mean all the stuff below is uh, is important. You need to take note of it. I thought you'd rather have that than have basically a stream of arrows coming at the side, which will make, probably will make you feel like you're a French knight at Agincourt or something, which probably wouldn't be very nice. So most kilns, of course, fire at a lower temperature. And so you need a flux. And I mentioned flux as regards to glass, and it's the same sort of thing. Fluxes. Lead, again. Uh, lead glazes will contain 50 to 60% of lead. So it's quite a lot. Highly toxic. Um, from the lead ore, uh, galena, typically. First appeared in the first century BC. And was right from the beginning a very widespread technology across the Silk Road from the Roman, Mediter Roman Mediterranean to Sogdian, uh, through Sogdia, through Sogdia, Sogdia is in Central Asia, to Tang, China. Here, for instance, is, is actually a hand dynasty, slightly earlier, uh, lead glaze uh, with a green copper based uh, pigment. And here's a Roman one, slightly later, but they seem to be about the same date. I haven't seen anything conclusive to say it started at one end of, of uh, the Silk Road earlier than the other. And uh, so it's really quite interesting. Here's a later Middle Eastern lead glaze wear over various slit paints. So more fluxes. Alkali fluxes can contain up to 20 to 30 percent alkali elements such as soda and potash. So that includes potash plant ash sources, that's why it's called potash, it's an ash that was in a pot, um, potash. And so these, this is plant ash, uh, you can make it out of ferns. In Europe they often use ferns or, or, or trees, the ash wood. Um, but in the Middle East they mostly use what is known as halophytic plants, which I'm not going to type out for you because, you know, it's not going to be on the test. And so these like salt, and you'll get them around uh, places where you have a lot of, of uh, salt. And if you remember back when I was talking about uh, parts of the world where you have water just evaporating away, uh, this is exactly where halophytic plants grow. In Egypt, however, they have natron, and this is a, a natural deposit of, of sodium, sodium carbonate. So it's the first developed in Mesopotamia, uh, from the third millennium BC on glaze composition or faience, and after about 1500 BC on clay. So this is a uh, quite early glazed composition, also called faience, uh, and uh, this would have originally been nice and shiny, and it would have been turquoise. It would have been copper co covered colored with copper uh, and it's an alkali glaze so it would be um, turned copper uh, turquoise rather <clears throat> so glaze composition or faience there are three main ways as efflorescence of making this in which you form the vessel which is mostly made of sand quartz sand crushed um, and the the glazing materials will effloresce to the surface when it dries and then you can fire it. You can also dunk it in a thing of glaze just as you would a, a fire clay ceramic and there's also cementation in which you put it in this big sandy um, and sintered uh, material uh, and you have something within it. This is like a bead or something and so when it fires, the uh, the glaze materials come out of the cement and fuse to the surface. This actually does work, and this way you can make like hundreds and hundreds of beads all at the same time. And here actually is a waster of some Roman, supposedly, uh, composition or faience vessel. So. We will now quickly go through what causes the colours on these glasses. There is antimony, which makes yellow. Chromium, which makes green. Did I 
point out that this had two arrows, two arrows. So just pretend there's an arrow for each one of these, okay? Chromium can make a dark green. Uh, it's unusual, but it, it does do that. Typically, chromium is good for black. So this black here is chromium. This blue is cobalt. So cobalt makes blue, chromium makes black. This has a cobalt blue glaze under enamel colors. This glass is cobalt blue. Cobalt can also make a gray, probably under reducing conditions, which if you remember are firing conditions which have less oxygen in them. Copper can make green. Now, if you remember, green is what a copper oxide looks like. And so typically this is fired under an oxidizing condition. Although what mostly will show you is that it's a lead glaze. This, however, is not a lead glaze. It's an alkali glaze or or it's an intermediate lead alkali glaze. And it's probably green because it's been fired under reducing conditions. This is uh, turquoise from copper. This is actually made as an opaque glaze from the addition of tin, which we will get on into later on. Iron can make yellow. Iron can make brown. Iron can make red. Okay, some more red. Iron can make green. This is a type of ceramic often known as celadon. And it's also why glass is green. The most ancient grass, glass has this green color and that is due to the iron in it. Manganese makes purple. That's what this color is here. And it also makes uh, uh, more purple, sort of black and purple. And it makes black. So the, the black bits of this black and white horse are actually manganese. But if you look very carefully, they're actually slightly purple. So that's how you can actually just look at it, this black paint and say, oh, this is manganese black because it's slightly purple. And tin makes white. Although tin can also make yellow, which is how this yellow is here. So, memorize all these colorants. So, that's that for, for now. And uh, happy Thanksgiving.